welcome back to this week's episode of Making It. Again, we have another fantastic guest on the show. Uh, we talk about culture, we talk about recruitment, the importance of recruitment and what, what, what it matters and how, how to hire the right people. We talk about diversity, inclusion in businesses and, and in society in general. We talk about you know, what the future of artificial intelligence is and how it will play a massive role in, in businesses around the world and why it matters and why you should start now. We talk about startups, obviously, um, and you know how to, how to create one, how to develop one, and, and what happens when you go wrong. Um, and lastly, we also talk about Mexico, and I'm just gonna leave it there in that one, uh, but you don't wanna miss this episode. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you guys to Dan Sodegren. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to Making It. So as I mentioned then, we've got Dan Sodergren on the show today. Uh, very, very excited and thank you for coming on, Dan. Happy to be here. Thank you, well, thank you very much for asking me, mate. Yeah, it's really not, fun. Not a problem. I think there's going to be some great insight here. So very, very excited. Um, but yeah, let's, um, let's start off with, I guess, going back to your time and how you got into where you are today. You know, I, I know you went to the University of Hull, uh, what probably feels like a long time ago now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it only feels like it was a very, very <laughs> long time ago. I'm older than you think. Yeah, you completed your, your degree there and, and obviously what, talk us through the rest, talk us through the, the history and how you came to where you are today. Well, it all started in 1976. No, I won't do the whole history, <laughs> but it did, it did start in 1976. I am that old. I'm actually I'm that old. I was joking with a, uh, on another podcast the other day about, because it's quite fun because I don't feel that old, but, uh, but I am actually that old so yeah so i was literally i can remember uh you know, using fax machines the wire to, uh, to literally to send over wireframes to people that's how old i am you know yeah. wireframes for design so um i had the joy of going to your whole university meeting some really cool funky people we started because back in the day the environmental uh, collapse of the planet hadn't really happened and so i had this kind of bizarre idea that i wanted to stop that so i was very much in the green movement and we did stuff with you know reclaim the streets and uh, you know, rebellion people and all sorts of green stuff. Anyway, the business that came out of that, it was a, it's actually a university society called Hempology. And Hempology is about teaching people about hemp, which isn't about marijuana. It's actually about the non-narcotic version of marijuana, which can be used for 35,000 different uses, including building cars and, and, you know, petrol can be used and it's like plastics and cosmetics and all sorts of made out of hemp. And basically, if you did that, you, the world wouldn't have this environmental catastrophe. I'm just going to park that bit. But the reason I was pretty passionate about hemp and I could bore the heck out of you with the, still with the whole thing. There's a whole reason why it was banned and it was linked with marijuana. Yeah, it's a good podcast on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't get me on that podcast. It's entrepreneurial, but it bore the heck out of most people. Anyway, so the green movement. So we did that and it was thing, the hempology movement, this political movement, trying to teach people about hemp. That then became THTC, which is the hemp trading company, which is still around today, which makes T-shirts. But originally we had 36 different products about hemp. I suppose that's one of the kind of key learnings that I learned when very young. And I was only um, 18 or so, maybe 21 by the time we'd finished that. Um, was THTC. And one of the things I learned from that was you've got to listen to the marketplace. Yeah, if you're going to start your own business, you're going to do stuff. Key thing to do is to listen to the marketplace. Now, when you're very young, is you're, you maybe have more political zeal or more wanting to change the world. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to change the world. Yeah. But to change the world, you have to have very, very deep pockets. Yeah. Because it costs a lot. So if you're going to try to educate the world and using hemp products, even the body shop found that tricky in just one product, which is hemp cosmetics. Yeah, We had 36 different products. <laughs> Literally insane. We had paper, plastics, concrete. We had loads because of course we were trying to change the world. Yeah, you get in the end. New directions. Yeah, exactly. That's that key because you're cleverer than I am already. That's the point. You get pulled in too many directions. So you can have this zeal and the values and the purpose that's absolutely awesome but if you want to make it a business and a business to make money in the capitalistic system we live in and you can argue against capitalism as long as you want and believe me feed the revolution we need better times yeah let's build back better politically and socially everything but if you want to make money and you're an entrepreneur an entrepreneur simply means risk taking if you're risk taking with your capital and want to change the world pick one thing you know pick a product and do your market research do that bit of market research so that's what i learned from THTC and you know it's still going today but we make t-shirts and we make very successful t-shirts with political slogans have a look www.thtc.co.uk 
we're now actually changing that company. I still have an interest in it. We're now changing it and doing more white label stuff and doing more digital stuff. But yeah. that's the thing. So that was, God knows, how, how many years ago was that? It was a long time ago. That was my first company. Um, yeah. Since then, I've had about, I think, about nine companies um, altogether. So because I did that with THTC, I did the marketing for THTC as well. That became a marketing and training company in itself. It actually became a marketing and events company to start off, which was called Spearfish. We did events like you'll be too, you, you're far too young to remember these events. But back in the day, people all met together in places, really? <laughs> in places where we had, yeah, no, <laughs> before <laughs> COVID. <laughs> 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 it's like before 95. The people used to meet and have massive, massive parties. And they weren't necessarily the illegal rave culture. We were kind of linked a little bit to that, but we kind of made it a bit more around sponsorship. So, yeah. you know, Smirnoff sponsored. Uh, uh, parties in forests and stuff like that and we did those things so a lot of cool stuff like the yeah. first breakdance competition with Red Bull the first DJ competitions with Red Bull Spearfish did those in Manchester we did those before they became a thing that they did nationally which is cool because that's what we did so so that, that became that was Spearfish and I sold that and then went to went to Mexico um, which is another story in itself I'm not going to tell you on this one um, but came back with only £3.75 to my name literally came back with no money yeah and the reason why I can tell this story so well well is because Every time I do a training, and I've done over I don't know, maybe three or four thousand different training sessions now because I'm that old, this is the story I have to tell. I have yeah. to tell this is my five minute spiel. Yeah? Uh, Why are you here, Dan? Why can you tell us about marketing? Why can you tell us about social media? Well, all started in 1976. Yeah, yeah. So, went to Mexico. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll cut it down for you. But went to Mexico, lost all this money, and I'm not going to tell you that story how, but you can imagine it's quite fun. Uh, fun looking back at it now. Um, that's another thing. If you're going to sign contracts, yeah. yeah, make sure you speak the language of the contract you're going to sign. Probably would help that, I guess, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I can kind of see the logic in that one. You see, instantly you see the logic. <laughs> Don't sign a contract in Spanish unless you speak Spanish. Yeah. Everyone always laughs at that moment in my training sessions. It's actually not that funny, but never mind. It, it's a bit of a moment. So, <laughs> came back, no money to my name. Luckily for me, an old business mentor of mine said, and again, get business mentors, very important. He basically said, look, tell the story. I've got this thing. I've got a gig at university. Tell the story to all these kids at university, yeah, and tell them how you started Spearfish and how you did the marketing stuff. Yeah, so that's what I did. I went and told the story, and they loved it, and they paid me an amount of money. It wasn't a huge amount. In fact, it was 50 quid. So that's what they paid me. My first gig was 50 quid, yeah. That then became Great Marketing Works, which then trained people in how to start their own business and in how to market those businesses. And then 10 years later, was it 10 years or was it 20 years later? No, I don't know. About maybe 10 or 20 years later, I was getting paid five grand to do the same kind of talk wow. for an hour. I was getting paid five grand to do. So it went from 50 quid yeah. up to five grand. And so mm -hmm. that's what it did. You know, it's a great marketing works has been around for a bit. And that's what I do. I go around the country teaching people how to start their own businesses, wrote a book about it. I help the government do stuff with uh, certain communities to help them as more. Got help people with people plus to help them come off the dole and start their own businesses. So I've started, you know, help people start businesses. We've literally had no money, had minus money. Yeah. Uh, with all they had is a computer and I've helped people start businesses and run tech companies that have had lots of money put into them and, and have grown so in my own personal entrepreneur things I know you wanted me to talk about that it's most probably about nine or ten different businesses five yeah. of them being in tech I know you guys are particularly interested in the tech stuff yeah I mean we do a lot lot here with the with the tech stuff and we do focus on like the developing side of it and developers and you know data scientists and that sort of stuff but That's cool. the, the, the amazing thing for me and the thing I'm trying to do here with making it is, is really get to, to understand the startup community and how, how that can, we can all come together and help companies grow and, and move forward. And I think that's what's amazing about what you've done and what you are doing. You know, it's, it's kind of helping companies and giving them that direction we spoke about earlier. You know, you get pulled in all these directions when you start a company and yeah. have someone next to you and, and give that counsel to kind of direct you. Um, it is so important now in which yeah. Start, yeah, no, no, absolutely. It's one of the hardest things for startups to do as well because mm -hmm. most people who start their own business, especially in technology, have a drive to do so. Yeah, mm -hmm. they want to create something, they are creators, they want to create something. Yeah, and so very similar with Spearfish, we used to have lots of artists and they were artists and they create stuff, but yeah. that doesn't mean you're a successful artist, it just means you're an artist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, one of the hardest things for any artist, and by the way, any tech person or any creator to do is to get feedback and to change what they're doing based on feedback. And artists are particularly bad for it because they'll just go, oh, I'm an artist, how dare you? 
I know with, you know, there are other artists that get paid a million quid. And of course they forget the business dynamics. It's like they go, oh, well, Van Gogh. It's like, yeah, but he died before he got paid any money. Yeah. So you can't, that's a bad example. You can't, you can't compare to that. <laughs> oh, a, a, if you do, that's good. Well, the only way to do that is for you to die now and then me to make money while you're dead. So that's not really a strategy that's going to work for you. Yeah? And we'd have to do that with tech. Now, but tech, however, is, you know, this is the, uh, this is the you know, innovators or innovators' dilemma. It's a great book. And you look, read things like, you know, Eric Dries stuff around Lean Startup and the Moms Test and all this information's out there. Yeah? So mm -hmm. if you are a coder especially and you want to create something, one of the problems you're going to have is you don't want feedback. No one has an ugly baby. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. everyone has, you know what I mean? Especially in tech, yeah. but believe you me, we do. Oh, yeah? I've seen them. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and, and believe me, and I know it's going to sound terrible, but other people are not involved in the process, and now it's going to sound weird. This is when the analogy drops down. But <laughs> everyone has ugly babies. If you have your own ugly baby, it's a very ugly baby, yeah? So, exactly the same way. I, I, I had a mobile games company for a bit, and we made some really ugly babies, yeah? And we hated it because we, we went out into the wild and we sent and everyone like, oh God, this is awful. I'm not going to play this. And we were like, how oh, dare you? We spent three months making this. But it's yeah. like, but no, no one asked us to make it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We didn't know. We just had an idea for a game. But that's not how you have a successful game team. Yeah. So when did you, you might, when did you kind of, sorry to interrupt there, when did you learn to take that negative and, and that, that, that feedback on board and kind of, you know, you said you got upset at first and, you know, you weren't happy. Yep. <coughs> when did you kind of learn to go, wait, I need to, I need to use this differently here. I need to kind of use this constructively and, and move forward and kind of take it on board. If, if I'm honest, I learned it when you just said that sentence. <laughs> Literally, I'm learning it every day, yeah? Because yeah. it's exactly that. You know, the old cliche, breakfast, uh, you know, feedback of champions is the breakfast, yeah? But that's true. You know, feedback yeah. is the breakfast of champions. It is. But it's a cliche, so you don't like it. So you hide behind it. So, oh, should I don't listen to it? Literally, we're learning it all the time. So at your flock, we are, like this morning, literally this morning, we had lots of feedback about something we, we, we created, and we've got to change it. Yeah. Now, that's very hard because it was my idea, but my idea was wrong because I hadn't listened to the customer enough and I hadn't understand the nuance of actually the position. Yeah. Now, if you are like me and you might be quite strong-willed, but also not necessarily very empathetic, as in you lack, you know, a huge amount of empathy and sometimes you don't listen enough then you can just make people say what you want them to say mm -hmm. so i can say is this great and you're going to go yeah damn yeah i don't want to say no yeah but, you know, but the actual question is oh, would you pay to use this no we wouldn't oh then that's not a business <laughs> you know what i mean so so you learn it every day and it's really hard to take that um feedback and well, actually, if you, as long as you take it, like your sentence says, as long as you understand that's how you grow. And yeah. one of the key things is, is learning to fail quickly. Yeah? yeah. So with past tech companies, I had a bit of a habit of sticking around for like two or three years, especially if it was my idea. I'd stay around and we'd try to make it work. We'd try to make it work. Actually, the, the, and I got it down actually after about two or three, I got it down to a process of about six months. So if that tech company didn't hit an inflection point, I knew, unfortunately, you had to take the puppy out and shoot it which is an awful way of looking at it, but it literally is that emotional because you're like, I don't want it to fail, but it's yeah. failed. I know. But what you should do is learn. Learn quickly that it fails and learn why it failed and then put that into the next one. Yeah. Or if you're a coder or a uh, data, science, or, you know, data science person or whatever, it's actually, it's just experimenting. It's just experiments. Keep going. And, and obviously that's what you've done over the, the past, you know, 10 years or so, like you say. And then in, in 2017, you came, you came and co-founded your flock. Um, and, and really, what, where, what have you learned and how are you putting that into your flock and, and what's the idea yeah. behind, behind this? Well, the, well the, I mean, the, the irony of flock is that, because flock itself, the reason why I invested in that, I've got to be careful words here, the reason why I invested in it, because I, I did not start this, Mikhail started this, and it's a great yeah. idea. I would had a very, very similar idea about five or six years before that, yeah? But I have a nasty tendency to start companies way before I should be. Yeah, so I had an augmented reality company you know, I think it's 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah and, that, and that's, if you know the industry well, that's an insane, I mean, that's pioneering. That's just, that's like turning up to America, you know, with a backpack and a bow and arrow. You know, it's just like, it's well before you should be going to America. It's like the first boat. And the, most of those pioneers die. You know, that's just the reality of the situation. <laughs> so even if you had all the money, like Blipper had loads of money, even Blipper, with billions of pounds on it, 180 people. I was there with Blipper when I think it was, I think it was 16 of us in a room. 
and they took me from Go Invented. And even with 180 people, they still didn't manage it and still didn't crack it. And they got had bitten it. They were, they were going to be a unicorn. They were a unicorn, and then they, then they came down. Um, so with Flop, I'd actually had that idea seven years ago. And then I bumped into McCann and he told me what he's doing. I was like, my God, this is exactly what I was looking to try to build seven years ago and fail. And the irony of it is, we fa I failed with the company. And most companies, tech companies I failed with, by the way, isn't around technology. It's actually around people. Yeah. yeah. People are it's people. literally yeah. the wrong people on the bus. Sometimes at the wrong time as well, maybe 10 years too early, but mm -hmm. the wrong people on the bus. With the, with the didn't share the same values and the same drive and purpose. And because of that, the company thought as soon as it gets hard, or even actually, ironically, when it gets successful. Depends what you make. You can, you can have too little money and people leave, or you can have loads of money and then people, people leave. leave anyway, because yeah. you, can't, you can't control the people. Yeah. But what you can do is talk about values and purpose. And that's what we have at Flock. So I know through the Flock system, you do the survey and some other stuff. And I had to do this survey, by the way, before I, um, before I was even allowed to invest in Flock. You have to do the Flock thing. So I did. Well, I've done it. I've done it myself. Yeah. Hey, there you go. There you go. Uh, I haven't looked at your. I should have looked at your flock before we start this conversation. I should have. Well, been. it's too late now. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely because the whole point of flock is to look at the value stuff underneath it, and then if you look at if you know your bell bins and your insights and all these, which there are lots of, they kind of go above it. Yeah, they kind of go above it. But the actual bottom bit is your flock bit. So I, I Michaela told me what it built, but it was a concept, and it wasn't a digital concept. It wasn't a tech company. It was so really your flock now is the digital transformation of his intellectual understanding of the process behind the psychology of teams. And right. that's, why it's quite, that's why it's exciting to do. That's why it's exciting. I hope you enjoyed doing the process. The, the flock survey is, well, let's see. It's, no, it's by no means finished though, Will. That's the point, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely interesting. And I think the, the concept behind it and the idea, I mean, obviously you want to kind of, you know, we'll discuss remote working in a little bit more detail, but that's the idea behind Flock. It's kind of help that and control them remote teams and kind of also my side of it, the recruitment side of it is, is kind of putting the right people into jobs and, and that's what, that value, what, what companies value and what they need, not necessarily over the experience sometimes. Well, yeah, that's, that's, oh, I'm so proud. Thank you. That's the kind of feedback I like. There you go. All right. It's exactly, you know, you get the support. <laughs> <laughs> a recruitment bike a person who a gets it but also gets where it's positioned but also understands that's the driver now for me personally that will be the next leap for companies the companies who understand this bit because by the way google does already and other people do already that's how they get the best talent because yeah. not because they have a ping pong table not because they have free beers on a friday not because you know because half these things actually for developers aren't actually eternal at all they're actually the opposite but they have all these things because they enjoy spending time together because they enjoy working together with purpose with the same kind of values aligned. So they know they're making something which is a great thing to make. Now, you can, and again, we've got to be careful with the word value here. We're not talking about political values. We're not talking about, you know, their viewpoint on ecology. You know, you can have the same values in a company that actually does something which I would find morally offensive. Like, I wouldn't like a load of people to come together to build a bomb, yeah? But people do because they work in defense. Now, but, you know, but they can have the same values. Uh, yeah. I could have the same values as them. So one of my values is autonomy. But I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's the same principle, but we can share the same values and we must surely make a team. I just wouldn't work in that company because I, I think that's a different thing. That's a belief system that I have, yeah. So that's the difference. So the flock, flock kind of sits at the bottom. Uh, I, that, I, I, I love the way you, you put that. That's exactly what I did. Um, so we created this little team and we've, we've also got our own team. So our team is a remote team anyway. So yeah. Flock sits very well in that process. But to answer your question from before, what I learned with Flock, and I think one of the key things I've learned with Flock is that user feedback is absolutely key. Yeah. yeah? The, the timing for a business is hugely important. Now, we're very, very lucky with your Flock because only 4% of people were working remotely like a year ago, maybe 5% of people were working remotely. And that has now rocketed to about 50%. And it may well come down. Oh, yeah. But yeah. It, but at the same time, even if it's only 10% of people doing, I think it'll be a lot higher than 10 uh, post COVID. I think it will. Um, that's still doubling the marketplace. So even by just sitting in the right place at the right time, yeah. our marketplace has doubled just by luck. Yeah. yeah. And it would have taken 10 years for that to have happened with Go Augmented. Yeah, definitely. And it took it took 10 weeks for Flock. So that's just yeah. so sometimes luck. It, yeah, that's it. I mean, the pandemic, obviously, a horrible thing. You know, it's been been yeah. terrible for so many people. But for for yourselves at Flock, it's kind of it's kind of 
put spearheaded you forward, hasn't it? It gives you that kind of that bump and that kind of increase in remote working because it's so. I think so many people. I mean, I've spoken to. Uh, 50 people this morning alone about, you know, roles and new roles and jobs. And, and they're instantly what they're saying is, you know, well, does it have remote working? Is it flexible? That is yeah. not so, long, so much a bonus anymore. It's a requirement for people now. Absolutely. It's gone from it being a nice to have to it yeah. just being a must have. It's like basic personal hygiene. It's like, so, I mean, this is one of the really interesting things is one of the questions that I think is actually a good friend of mine, Jeremy Blaine, and some other people in a different podcast we were talking about, but, he, it's a really good point. Um, and Sam Mickelson echoed this as well. But one of the big questions you're going to get now from a company is going to be literally, what did the company do during the COVID response? Yeah. Yeah, what was their COVID response? Not just, oh, we helped people do this and we, we didn't charge for that and all that kind of stuff. But actually, what did you do for your employees? What was your employee brand? And actually, moving forward, you can't say, oh, we're not flexible because no one's going to work for you. Yeah, you can't say, oh, we don't do remote work because no one's going to work for you. And especially in the industry we're in, I mean, we did some research with LinkedIn and that I think for financial professionals, it's 93% now insist that it has to have flexibility in the work world. It's 87% for tech. Yeah. Now, you know, that's, and by the way, it should be. Of course it should yeah, be. You shouldn't have to be forced to get... I mean, yeah, of course it's... can sit and do it anywhere. If it's good for their mental health to sit at home and, and do it and then... The office is now a place of collaboration. So you go to the office and it's a place where you can, you can, yeah, you can have a bit of fun with your friends, but you collaborate on projects together. Um, yeah. And then do your work where you want to do your work and when you want to do your work. That's important as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A, 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 the asynchronous thing, which is something that I, because I'm really old, so I still play out with the whole, I wake up early and I work. And then I, you know, at some point I don't. And I'm still, even though it's not nine to five, because you know, if you're an entrepreneur, it's always seven to seven, but that's not really the point. But it's just continual. And I've always had that, just working quite hard. But actually, I'm learning with Flock, you've got to, you will burn out if you just keep working all the time. Yeah. You can still love it. So that whole asynchronous kind of working pattern, because we have people around the world as well, so they'll work at different times. So you've got to use Trello. You've got to use Google Docs. You've got to use collaborative technologies. You can't not, because... You can't all say, oh, everyone get here at nine o'clock. It's like, shut up. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> it's four o'clock in the morning. And that, that's what's different now. It's not, I think the key between remote working and home working is something people need to make for sure we differentiate because home working is nine till five in essence, isn't it? That, that's the idea behind it. Whereas remote working is working where you want. It might be at home, but it doesn't have to be, to be between them set hours. And that's the thing well, that's key for people. I don't know either, mate. I'll be honest with you. I think... After COVID now, I think we're even going to get this next bit, which is like, I know it sounds a bit silly, working from home. It, it always makes me smile because remote working is, is working from home. But yeah. also, because I'm old, because I've got, I've got a child. So at the moment, I've literally, today is the first day that my child hasn't been here, yeah, because I'm homeschooling. So this afternoon, I'm going to be working full time, working. And I, and I might actually finish work at five o'clock, but I'm not going to. I'm actually on a podcast until 10.30, but that's not the point. <laughs> With my first first evening off when I'm working, but there you go. So don't don't listen to what I do. That's not a good. It's not good good life balance. Um, but the point being is, on Friday I might be able to take some time off. Yeah, and I won't be looking after my daughter at the same time and feeling guilty. So everyone keeps talking about work from home, but actually, we parents have been working from home through a pandemic. Yeah. yeah? The yeah. next month, if we're, if our kids are allowed to go back to school, it will be a fascinating thing because at the moment productivity is higher anyway. About seventy percent of black people are saying that they are more productive. Yeah working from home than they are working in the office. Yeah. And the irony being is that people, and it's really, I just find, because I always just find this stuff always fascinating, but the office is just a vessel of, of factory working. And people forget this. People are like, whoa, offices, that's a thing. It's like, no, it's a concept. And the reason why it's a concept is look back in history and find out why. Well, everyone's working in fields. Then they came into a factory. Then the bosses of the factory worked in an office. Yeah. That's where it's from. Yeah, it's not the best way of doing anything. It's because the office was above the manufacturing plant. That's yeah. why. Yeah, that's it. When the manufacturing plant moved somewhere else, the office stayed and you had information workers in an office. Now that, that's it. That's all it is. It's just the evolution of office is no office. Because yeah. the off you don't need to have an office. Yeah. An office is still it's technology. It's not it's not a requirement anymore, is it? At all. No, of course not. You just have a you know, just have a G drive and have Trello and all these other things. Now, your point's a really good one, which is human beings might want to come back to the office to meet and have a chat and play football or table tennis or brainstorm and have a beer and do whatever, you know? I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying you have to have a drink and kill drink tech. That's a very old fashioned view. 
But but I also think the old fashioned view potentially is also this office culture. Yeah. I'm, I talk to lots and lots of people and I can see more and more people wanting to go back to the office because they want the office banter. But yeah. actually, I don't know because I'm a boss as well, the office banter isn't necessarily that productive. And also, it's a certain type of person that wants to go back to office banter. Wow. It tends to be the person, by the way, who says it's office banter when everyone else doesn't think it is. Yeah, that's definitely the person. <laughs> <laughs> one in our office to replace. <laughs> 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 edit out any names from this moment in, but I tell you that, but you know, absolutely. And yeah. David Wright, you know, and this is the next level of work, isn't it? It's being emotionally aware enough to understand that actually, you know, it's, to be honest, without being read about it, I do a lot of work with lots of companies where it's the boss. You know, mm -hmm. the boss is saying, get back to work and we can all have bants. And it's like, yeah, if I did loads more work at home, yeah, 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 but shut up, come back on Tuesday. What, so you can take the piss out of me? Really? Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that the plan? Not yeah. really what I'm going for, yeah. <laughs> Same thing. One as well. I'm going to work That makes me smile. No, I mean, it, it, it's, it's definitely changing. We know the, the world is changing in that respect and, and remote working and culture and that being so important now for companies. Um, but we were talking and, and obviously a point that it's well worth bringing up is the kind of diversity and inclusion side of things. Now, it, I feel personally, in my opinion, it is changing and it's getting much better and there's much out there. But I mean, what, what have you found, you know, being involved in so many businesses and so many places? Diversity and inclusion. Obviously, being a brown chap and already getting, getting the words wrong because people have got it. I don't know. I judge you. I, a lot of people say, come to me, and rightly so, by the way, say diversity and inclusion because they know it's going to be uh, something that I'm passionate about. Yeah, But I'm passionate about com company change. I'm passionate about lots of things. Yeah? Diversity and inclusion is hugely important. This whole move to a more remote working thing absolutely allows that to really happen, but yeah. to properly happen. You know, and we just talked about office banter and other stuff, but the reality is that the modern workplace is not very nice for certain people. Yeah. yeah? It's too big. It's a bit like you know, the whole doing stuff on with hemp and trying to change the world and trying to stop global warming. Yeah. I can, st I can stand here and pontificate about the reasons behind it, but in reality, it doesn't make any difference, yeah? Mm. What we can do is we can create the new, which is why I'm always about build back better. How do we build back better? Well, the way to build back better is to employ more people who are diverse and be more inclusive in your, in your, in your practices. That's just full stop. Now, a good friend of mine, Tom Cheeseright, uh, Book of the Future, says, and he's right saying, I've always argued against him, but he's absolutely right. People don't tend to make these changes until it's economically viable for them to do so. Yeah. And I've always argued against it because I come from a kind of spiritual, ideological background where it's like, but people will want to do the best thing because the world's a nice place. And, but he's right. Yeah, At the end of the day. don't necessarily do things when it's going to cost them money, for example. Do they, they... Precisely. So let's say, for example, let's use one example. Disability. Yeah. Loads of people who are disabled might be and are great at doing things. But yeah. lots of bosses in the back of their mind might be like, actually, that's going to cost me, which is awful. And basically, we should make laws against it. And technically, we have laws against it, but they're not enforced by the police. So it's very tricky to do. However, if you're now remote working, that shouldn't, no one should care no, it's about that. that. Now, they should, by the way, you should always have, everything should be so it's inclusive from a disability point of view. And we have laws against not doing it. Yeah. So this does not abrogate our responsibility, by the way. They, people would like to come into the office. But the same principle, though. Like, it's such a tricky thing with, in recruitment, but... You know, if you are creating, and tech is very, very renowned for this, which is why I bring it up, it's very, very renowned to have a kind of work, very white, male, ego-driven type of thing. Now, I can't talk about STEM, I can't talk about the lack of candidates and all that kind of stuff, but the great work by people like uh, Rebecca Taylor and Tech Returns and other things is just proving this digital gap to be wrong. Yeah. If you create a culture where women and other people don't want to work in your business, that's your fault. Yeah, it's not it's not the world's fault. It's not well. There aren't enough coders who are women. No, they don't want to work for you. Yeah, that's the honest truth, mate. That's There's the thing. There's one hundred percent enough out there. I speak to yeah. every day. Yeah. Absolutely, and precisely. Yeah. Now it could be the it could be how do you put your how do you word your documentation is wrong and therefore it's not attractive. How you how what your employee brand is like is wrong. Yeah. So I, the diversity and inclusion thing, I think personally for me, is kind of almost a misnomer because actually in reality you build that better by having a better culture in your company, which then attracts the right people and you get the right people. So all you need to have is one bad apple. You know, all you need is one racist to make people do a brand not want to turn up to your company. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it's not that complicated. Yeah. You, you, you should kind of fire that person who's racist if you want to have been more diverse and inclusive. Now, yeah. you might find out actually that you've got a sexist culture without even knowing it, but that's because you've never looked at it. And unfortunately, lots of tech companies have a bizarrely, you know, uh, is it called, I don't, I'm not, because I don't specialize this. Amy Newton's great at this, she specializes in this stuff. There's a lovely term for it where, you, where you're sexist without realizing you're being sexist, basically. Yeah. In fact, you're trying to be, it's like, like being gallant and you open the door for someone, you think that's a nice thing to do, but actually, you're really just putting them on a pedestal and making them different, and it's yeah. just a weird thing. So, you know, I'm an old man, so I'm, you know, I, I was opening doors thinking it was gallant for 20 years. So, so my whole thing is, as soon as we've got this remote working thing kind of cracked, it opens the world up to not only recruiting around the corner, but anywhere in the world. Now yeah. that changes that changes the whole diversity and inclusion thing. And by the way, I'm not just talking about young people, you know, old people, black, white, everything, of course, everything. Because what you really want is the best talent. You know, you don't want that's people that you can. That's what matters. If you want to create yeah. a product or create something, what what's going to drive your company forward or bring someone on what's going to do that, you know, if it's marketing or or whatever kind of sector you're working in, you want the best. And it shouldn't matter whether, you know, the, the colour or the race or the, the gender, it should not matter. You know, you no. want to drive a company forward. It's all about talent and the value. And we said that before, the value for your company. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are different ways that we can start recruiting that, that helps that, doesn't it? You know, the... The big one for me would be things like we did this years ago with the blink tests, you know, taking off people's names off survey, off uh, off CVs. I mean, I don't I don't work in recruitment, so I can't tell you guys what to do. But there's lots of things we can start doing, you know, and making things test based. Which I you know, with coders, surely that's what you do anyway. You go yeah. on and you can see how well they code. Yeah, I mean, they have yeah. their benefits, they have the drawbacks, but a lot of the time it kind of filters out the people who know what they want to do and the, the right people for that role. Um, not everyone does do well on tests. You know, it, unfortunately, it's the same as school. Not everyone did well. Um, well, no, no, absolutely. And, that, and that's another barrier, isn't it? So setting up tests, which seems like a good intention, actually, could be the opposite because it could do with Asperger's yeah. and all sorts of neurodiversity things. And again, you know, Rachel Trimmer, who is just fantastic at this stuff. So I suppose my point is, if you are interested in this, there are specialists out there yeah, who you can just chat to and they will tell you things that you are doing wrong. Obviously pay these people as well. I mean, they just chat to them and then say, bye, thanks, thanks so much for that, bye. That's bad. Yeah, yeah, the other thing is cool. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for doing a good thing and then bye. Um, yeah. The other thing I would always say, and of course I would do, because I work for Flock, so I would say, you know, one of the things you can do is everyone does the Flock test to start off with just to make sure that you are recruiting the right people. So, you know, if you've got five candidates that are looking pretty similar in all the other tests you've done, have them do the flock test because mm -hmm. they will need to be not like you from a demographic point of view, not like you from a wage point, not like you for any of these other things. It's the values, it's the stuff underneath it. You know, if your company needs to have them to be autonomous and to be able to be and customer focused and to you know, they, these are values that they have intrinsically in well, them. Well. Exactly. Yeah. exactly, it's what drives you. It's your motivations and and. Often this stuff, I don't, I'm not sure this stuff can be taught. You know, like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, you can try to make me as caring as you like, and I think I'm quite a caring person, but te caring is not high on my list. So, you know, it's all very well, because I, but politically, I'm massively caring and tremendously more left-wing than Trotsky. So in that respect, but from an actual work point of view, yeah. I'm not driven by that. It does not, not drive me, you know, but I happily give money to people that want to do that more, and I'd love to have a more caring world, but it doesn't drive me. If you put me in, in a place where there's lots of teamwork and a, and a very caring environment, I'm going to basically be really bad at that environment. Because yeah. you know? <laughs> I am. I'm like, don't like any of this, don't like it, and then I'm going to, you know, it's going to be a bad thing to do. So I think that's one of the things that, you know, you've got to, and I've got to be careful with words, of course, is that, that as we're going through this kind of global change, yeah, there's going to be a huge opportunity to use technology to make leaders more acutely aware of the support their team needs yeah and it isn't necessarily just a bigger monitor yeah and you will find that some people aren't don't want to do remote work you shouldn't be trying to force everyone into it because it doesn't work like that but also you might find that there's going to be a lot of churn rate i think in the next year and we might find that a lot of people don't like working for the companies that they work for and we know this by the way without being rude about it is when you tell them to come back to work they say oh um not quite yet. 
let me just um, furlough. Yeah, I'll just, can I, can I stay on furlough? <laughs> if anyone's saying to me, can I stay on furlough for a bit longer? That isn't a good sign. No. Okay, that's a get. <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> but a red flag. But there's been like 44% of people are looking at their job role now because of this massive change in culture. And I don't know what the percentage is. I think it's, it's insanely high, though. But people would pick the culture before an increasing wage. Yeah. So not only are we playing in this new world where remote's a thing, actually values and culture is now a much bigger thing. And I think we're going to see a lot of movement around that. And that's going to be the future of stuff. There'll be you know, people will literally pick, they'll use their labor to say, okay, can I make the world a better place? Maybe, I'm a massive hippie, so I'm hoping that. But they also might start saying, actually, I don't wanna work for that company anymore because that company doesn't align with my values. And I don't know if that's, that's happened lots before. I mean, from before, before my time, I mean, I speak with, with my directors who have been in, in recruitment for 20 plus years, you know, they, they've seen it all. And, and I'll use I'll use something you said earlier, so I'm not naming any any names of any companies out there at the moment. <laughs> but you mentioned bomb making, for example. So going to a mm-hmm. company that makes bombs. Now, previously, years and years ago, people had issues necessarily going into that industry, and like you said, you know, it wouldn't feel right. But I found set, since I've started recruitment as well, and, and and obviously talking to the guys over the last few years, more people have less issue with that, and they kind of well, it pays my wages. Whereas right. now, as you're saying, I'm seeing a transition towards culture and yeah. you know, direction in the company. And I'm speaking to people all the time from contractors who are considering perm work to go, well, I want to go to the right role, not necessarily a high paying role. And yeah, absolutely. it's all about making that choice. And I feel it shifted one way and it's definitely shifting back a little bit now. And hopefully that's Weird, isn't it? Weird, isn't it? I think if I've actually got the stat, we did some research on this. So... 34% of people leave work due to bad culture alignment. Yeah, so they, they don't fit in anymore. And I think that's going to increase. As you right said, I think that's going to increase because this, this moment has been like a great, for me personally, it's been an interesting reset. Like you've pushed the button and you've gone, actually, what am I about? Now, I'm quite lucky because I had the joy of having my own businesses. So I, could, I kind of picked what I was about. And I've, I've done all my work on values when I was, when I, I'm a hippie. So I did that like quite a few years ago and so I got rid of stuff and, and did a lot of what, you know, you went traveling around the world, and did all this kind of stuff read a load of books and you know, said, oh, this is what I'm about. So for example, creativity, respect and love, they're my core values that I know. So if a company doesn't, have, doesn't display that to me, I don't even pick them as a client. Yeah, but that's because I'm self-employed, I can do that. Now, I've never really worked for anyone where I haven't been aligned to their values because most of the time people ask me to work for them and I say yes or no. So I'm quite lucky in that respect. Yeah. Now, the other way around, would I lack the, would I work for someone that I wasn't, I don't, you certainly wouldn't be productive. You might work with them, but you wouldn't yeah. wouldn't work you wouldn't work your best. Or you won't, you know, do more and kind of be productive. No. You kind of hate what you do, won't you? And, and not want to. Well, I, do I, I don't. You know, this is the thing, isn't it? If you're if you're not working with value and purpose and mastery and all these cool stuff, you can't be working at a hundred percent productivity. And this is the bit we're into now, aren't we? The world's got to become more productive, and I don't want to get too deep about it. But the next year. Almost every company is going to have to be more productive because we had kind of six months where we weren't doing a lot. Yeah. Uh, or every like half the people have got to have, not have any jobs. Now that's cool in a kind of weird way. And most people, if you're into economics and stuff, this is some pretty, it's some pretty cool, funky stuff. We're going to go through this trough. Yeah. Now the question for us is, do we bounce back really quickly? Yeah. And does, does the government and other people do what they did in the 1920s with the New Deal in America? And the government go right, we're going to employ all of you to do something cool. So every young person is now going to be employed to build tree put trees in the ground and build stuff yeah because that's what we that's what we have to do that's actually what we have to do or you don't basically and everything goes to rack and ruin and everyone goes oh get back into the office and buy another pret sandwich and then half the people get made redundant and then everyone's like oh there's no money and then everyone doesn't buy anything and then you have massive inflation (laughs) and then you basically have germany in the 1930s nothing good Nothing good happens at that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets very dark very quickly. Second term of Trump, basically. That's what's going to happen in America. Fall of America. It's going to be fascinating 10 years. Now, as Britain, because we're not America, we've got the chance where we can build back better. Yeah. But to do so, we need to be politically aligned to some really great things. So Andy Burns done some great work on the kind of pillars of the, the, the industrial strategy. But we've got to actually do those now. So we've got to employ people that are into green technologies. So there's a load of cool stuff you can start doing. Health tech stuff, 
amazing stuff. So with the landing, we're doing stuff with health tech and in green tech and smart cities. And that's really exciting because that's the bit where we're going to have to grow and build back better. I'm glad you brought up the landing actually and what they're doing and the people there actually. I do want to kind of touch on that and, and discuss that in a bit more detail because I think they are, they've literally got so many interesting and like futuristic companies coming in now with the health tech, med tech and, and, and everything else. It's, it's going to be an exciting time for them, isn't it really going forward? I think so, you know, another, another one which is really, really well placed. It'll be interesting to see from anyone, by the way, this is not just the landing, but I had the joy of, I worked with, again, proving how old I am, I worked within a space, which was the first uh, incubator space in Manchester, part of MMU. This was 15 years ago, yeah? So now, and I also then worked with a few more and helped set up another couple in, uh, well, help them with the marketing side of the Barclays ones on Dean's Gate and some other ones. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's now 49 of them. Yeah, there's, I think it's the thing. That's because I did a bit of market research. I think it's 49 now that you have incubated. Remember, 15 years ago, we won. We're the first. Yeah? Now it's 49. Now that's not even co working and accelerators and everything else. Put that on top, it's about 120. Yeah, that's just in Greater Manchester. Yeah, that's just in Greater Manchester. That's, that's just insane growth in Greater Manchester. Yeah. yeah, so each one of these things has to do something different to survive. COVID, you know, it's fascinating to see what will happen with things like WeWork. Yeah. Now, a lot of people look at it and go, oh, my God, it's going to be it's going to be a catastrophe for them. But actually, when you look at it and you flip around, you know, never let never let a good crisis go to waste. And I know that sounds awful, but that's the reality. Yeah? There's mm -hmm. an opportunity in every crisis. Now, there will be a massive land grab in this moment because so many people are just pausing and going, what should we do now? If, if you start looking at the thinking behind it for other companies. Yeah. There's a lovely term that Bruce Daisley uses, he uses the, the term uh, hotelification. So the hotelification of the space. And that's where we're going to go. We will go into a world where you will use an office like you use a hotel. Yeah. That's, that's how it's going to happen. And you, but you'll get people that will come in and say, oh, we want it on Monday for five hours, and then we don't want it again until Friday. Yeah? yeah. Because they'll know that the boom's response to it. Now, this is a big difference for property, because this means that property cannot just do what it used to do. Yeah, and it might be the city centres can't do what they used to do. And what we've got to not do is say, oh, let's all rush back to the city centres because people aren't, I don't think people are going to, but also they don't have to. You know, I, I've spent more money now in my local Stretford area than I've ever done in my life because I've been here more. That's great for local businesses. By the way, that's better for the British economy because if I spend money in, I hate to say it, but if I spend money in Starbucks, the money doesn't stay in England. It goes somewhere else. And the reality is, if you were helping a local business more, then we're building back better, yeah? Now, if the government want to say, oh, but everyone get on the trains and go back to the city centres, okay, except we don't want to get ill, so don't think that may happen. But also, me sitting in McDonald's doesn't help England as much as me sitting in a local cafe. Yeah. So I'm going to sit in a local cafe. Yeah. And so that, that's the, well, that's going to be the question for us all. It's going to be, do we go for local co-working spaces? I think there'll be a great opportunity to, or yeah. do we go for these massive multinationals like we were? We work, I think, is in a great position where it could become a ho almost like a hotel experience. Yeah. And that's actually a very strong play right now. Yeah. The question for me, personally, working with the landing, is how does the landing go against that and make sure we have a unique selling point? Now, we're really lucky. We're in Media City. The landing being in Media City means it's really good from a health point of view. It's really good from a – just loads of really good things from us. Now, that's all post-COVID. Beforehand, it wasn't as good. But now, post-COVID, it's better. So we're out, so we're out of town. Yeah, it's a very clean environment. There aren't any cars around. We can do autonomous vehicle stuff. We've got 5G. You know, we've got the health tech stuff. We're linked into the universities. It's a brilliant spot to be, which is why, thanks very much for mentioning it, we have so many cool tech startups there because all those things are interesting for a tech startup. Yeah. So we're in a really, really strong position. Whether um, co-working will exist as we see it in the next year, I think that's really interesting. I think a lot of our accelerators will become online accelerators. Um, and I actually think the, the bigger play will be having companies do stuff online and then coming to the landing to do yeah. something together, like 3D printing or test it on 5G or the IoT space. But, uh, you know, I'm not the boss of the landing. That's what I'll say. Now. Yeah, yeah. Do you reckon there's a, there's a space for um, events, events and stuff like that at the landing then in the future? Do you reckon the whole event culture and people coming together to to, I don't know, do, do certain things and, and marketing things and, and, and come together. Yeah, yeah. Together yeah, we think, well, we're, we're a bit controlled by the virus, aren't we? So, you know, it depends. So if we have another wave, then the answer's no, but the answer's no because it could kill loads of people. So it's better not to do that. 
yeah, if yeah. it doesn't and we, we get a vaccine, then everything changes. But I don't think we'll go back to the old ways of doing stuff, no matter what happens. Even if they say tomorrow, there's no more COVID, everyone, it's never going to happen again, which of course is physically impossible to do. I still think that mentally people are still going to be like, okay, I don't need to do what I used to do all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it might be like an 80 20 split. But I think there's an amazing amount of value for human beings coming together, yeah, physically. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to risk. The, you know, the health of my child or my parents based on that presumption. Yeah. So if you look at things like hopping, which is a really cool bit of te- uh, technology, and you know, there are lots of, obviously, thousands of Zooms, you know, we all know these yeah. technology now, yeah. yeah. But there's, 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 I think that's just the start of this. You know, Zoom is just, Zoom isn't perfect. So it's the start of this. And as I've been, you know, talking about before, I've been saying this for about 10 years. So the digital transformation stuff I've been saying, you know, I used to say to people, you know, let's have a Zoom meeting. And they were like, what? Shut up. Come down to London. I'll be like, yeah, but it cost me 200 quid to get a London. Yeah, cool. We'll see you in London. Oh, it's of your time or whatnot. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Around. It's not yeah. like- Plus having to get around. Plus like, my whole day just to do some filming in London or just to have a meeting. No. Now, we'll do a Zoom call. Okay, cool. So you can have 11. Now, don't get me wrong, we're now in a position where having 11 Zoom calls a day is not a good way to do that. But that's, that's just bad management of your own personal time. Yeah. That's not the technology. It's just... Uh, yeah. don't- Always have a break. Good idea. That's just, you know, probably remote technique, whatever it is. Um, so I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity for the landing to do events. I think there's a really exciting opportunity to use the connectivity we have at the landing to mm-hmm. do events to a much wider audience. So you and the, you know, you and your boss and some other people might go and do a fireside chat with that. And then the landing then sprays it out on a much higher bandwidth than Zoom can do to lots and lots of people because you actually need a much higher connectivity. That's a really good use of our fiber optic cables and other cool stuff. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what we should do. And have more uh, globally interactive events. Yeah, that would be that yeah. would be a really good use of the space. I also believe that people will start wanting to and relishing coming back. It'd be interesting to see by Christmas if people not don't want to meet face to face. But uh, um, I did a talk with Tom. She's right um, about about uh, just before this all happened, and uh, it was about the Barcelona massive Barcelona Mobile World Congress being cancelled. And yep. we were talking about growing. And luckily for us, we, we said things that actually panned out as we're both futurists. Um, so we, so we were very embarrassing. But of course, we wouldn't have known. We didn't to the extent this would happen. Um, but we were saying it was a good cause of cancelling because if we had, if they hadn't, but at the time, lots of people were arguing that we should, you know, they should have cancelled the, the event. Same now with the events industry. I completely understand that events are really important to a lot of people because it's their job. And I completely understand that airlines are important because it's their job. But yep. I think we've all got to kind of sit back and go, What's important for Britain, not just the economy, but actually for people living. So uh, we're not only going too much of a soapbox in that one, but uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity, but we just got to weigh it up against up and, and do what's yeah, against the risks. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I mean, uh, to finish off, uh, I mean, you, you, we talked about there, you know, what what it takes to kind of sk- sk- take a business to the next level and scale it, and and the use of flock. So. I mean, I'd love to finish on a point of where where do you see Flock in the future? Uh, what, what are your goals with that, and how would you look at scaling that? And what would you say to other people looking at scaling their startup as well? Like, have you got any 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 tips of uh, tips for that? Yeah, I was going to say, but you know, I've done this, I've done this a few times. But as my mum would rather say, you know, not so clever. You're not on a beach now, Dan. So she's got a good point. You know, I, I'm not a multi-millionaire, so you know, I don't see my house in swimming pool. So you know, let's not get too carried away. Um, but I have to have done. I've done it. Not my first time at picnic, so I've done this quite a few times. Yeah. So to scale a company, and I've got to be again really careful with words because there is an obsession with scaling a company through people, if that makes sense. So and also doing it with investment, and I've again really got to be careful. So there are brilliant ways of scaling a business, and of course one of the ways is to get investment. Now I would say if you're a tech company, and from my experience, it's very hard to bootstrap a tech company. Yeah, to actually do it with your own money, especially in the B2B environment. It's very, very hard to do. Doesn't mean it's not impossible. MailChimp did it, yeah, but they're outliners. There's literally a million people who didn't do it before MailChimp did it, yeah? yeah. So depending on your environment, you've got to be very careful with bootstrapping because the reason why investment is out there and the reason why VCs exist is because it's very hard to do it with your own money unless you're very rich. And if you are very rich, you tend not to care that much about doing it because <laughs> you're quite rich and you're like, Oh, well, never mind. Didn't happen. No. Yeah. Or you could be driven by something else. And that's, that's totally fine. Not the end to that much too much. Um, if you actually find that a lot of people, and this is one of the fascinating things about tech companies, when you start looking at the actual data, not the stories, but the actual data, how old do you think um, the average person who has a, a successful 
uh, round A or Series A tech companies. How old do you think the founder is? Oh, God, I, I'm going to go with 45. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, about 40, about 40. Well, I'm hoping about 45 because that would be me next year. So that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, boom. So, what five, like. well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so my plan is that I'll be a successful 45 year old SaaS tech company owner with Block. Absolutely, that's exactly the plan. You know, we've got to go for investment because of the stuff we are doing, which is going to be around AI and data and other stuff. It's almost impossible to bootstrap that company. Yeah, and we've been doing it now for two, three years, and it's been great. But the move from, and again, loads of stuff about it, but I'm going to try to keep it down. So um, loads of stuff you can talk about with SaaS companies and do you want to go for concierge style and look at the rework model and there's loads of other stuff. Lovely article you can read, which is called uh, The SaaS Graveyard. Yeah, and it talks about where you should position yourselves, and it's like a Bible for the SaaS people. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. most people would have, would have read it. Um, so to, to transition from kind of going from enterprise into a SaaS self-service model, that takes people, and it takes investment and money and time. Yeah, That's very hard to bootstrap. So for Flock, we will need to get investment. We've already got, we've gone to several accelerators, and we've been on a couple, and very, very successful. Um, we are now going to scale that company, um, the hardest thing for scale is get investment. Yeah. Um, then I'd say it's people and I'd most probably turn that around. I'd most probably say it's people first. People. You know, and if you're a, if you're a small tech company, the investors look at people, 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 product people. That's what they look at. Yeah. So it's your team because they know that you're going to have to pivot and they know you're going to have to change. Yeah. And if your team isn't agile enough and it hasn't got the experience enough to actually take that on board, your first point you said, the first point of the podcast, a really good one. You know, when you start learning this feedback's a positive thing, yeah. well, a lot of entrepreneurs don't, a lot of tech guys don't, and a lot of tech women and people don't. I'm not going to say that women are better with the feedback. I don't know. I don't have the data behind that, but I have a feeling mm -hmm. the more inclusive your team is, only because I do have the data for this, the more inclusive and more diverse your team is, the better you are as a team, because, and the more investment you're going to get and the more success you get. Now, I don't know if that's because of the intrinsic qualities that other people bring to it and do they cut down the ego of the co of the founder and the co-founder? I think that's majority it. Most people, if they're just a founder by themselves, will find it very hard to get investment, especially in Europe, because it's just, you know, we just don't like it. And it's to do with this whole ego thing, yeah? So find a co-founder, find a mentor, yeah? Find a, um, a really powerful board. We're very lucky in Flock, but we've got Sandy Lindsay who's on our board. He's just a you know, legendary fun. Loved her for years and years and years. So legendary, you know, multiple uh, award-winning entrepreneur. And we've managed to get her on our board. We've also got uh, Laura as well from uh, and other people uh, on our board. So we've got four or five people, and two of them I shouldn't mention, so I'm not going to, um, who are on our board, and they're non-execs. And that really strengthens our team. Yeah. yeah. But we know that we need a bigger coding-based team because of the world we're going to move into, which is AI. Yeah. So we will, need a we will need a data scientist when we've got enough data. We now need... We know, and we're about to work with a company, again, a name I can't mention, because they are going to be, we're very lucky to have them, but they're going to help us with the AI proposition, which is the next level. So to answer your question, yeah, taking Flock, building the team, making sure everyone shares the same values, of course, using Flock, makes sense. Um, but making sure that we've got enough investment for them to live happily, so it's not too scrappy. Because one of the things that I'm very aware of getting a bit older is, if you don't provide that sense of security, and you know that is actually underpinning it. At the moment, what you don't want to have is uncertainty because life's hard enough at the moment without also saying, "Oh, by the way, we might not be able to pay you next month." Yeah. Because people don't people don't want to hear that. That's important. <laughs> yeah, you need the security. And if soon as you've got that security, you've got the trust level, then you've got to pick the right people on the team. I, you know, and I've got to be again careful with. I think if we have too many people on the team, then Flock itself hasn't worked because I believe that the next level of stuff is going to be without people. Yeah. yeah. So I would much rather have a much bigger server with a much cleverer AI system on there than four more developers. Yeah. Because the AI bit would be... AI, obviously, you know, do you see that as the future then for a lot of businesses going into it now, artificial intelligence? Do you reckon that's the, the future? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, really, really, really heavily to the extent uh, I, I'd say that AI is like electricity. It is literally the yeah. thing that will drive you. If you're saying, you know, it's a bit like saying, well, we're going to have a laundrette, but we're going to go down to the river to wash the shirt, wash the shirts. Um, that's okay. Of course you can. That's awesome. But it's going to be hard. And you're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, but that's the best way to do it. And I'm like, okay, wash your wash the shirts manually, but no one's going to pay you more. And they're like, yeah, 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 but that's the best way. Cool. I'm not going to argue with you. 
absolutely not going to argue with you if you say AI is not for you, but someone else is going to use AI in their business, which does exactly what you do, and they're going to do it 10 times quicker. Do you reckon that will create more opportunity for people or, or reduce jobs in, in the market? That's a good that's question. A, that's, a very, that's a very deep question. <laughs> to say. And then, which, which gods should we believe in there? I don't know. Right, so, so to be honest, answer. The honest answer is, from a from futurist point of view, and you've got to remember, this is the same guy that had an AI company, a AR company 10 years ago, had an AI company actually about four years ago, before even the terms really were coming up. I was doing something with the algorithm. I actually had a company which sold ass. I just love the fact that it sold ass, because I could say that. Um, it's algorithm as a service. So we actually had a company that sold ass. Just oh. love it in fashion. Anyway, just got to say that. Um, that was called uh, iFashionista. Now, now, now that's a very fashionable concept, yeah? Um, before, four years ago, it was not. Now, we're going to have a bit of a moment now where a algorithms and AI are going to be mixed up together. Algorithms at the moment have got a bad name, but they've got a bad name politically for some very weird reasons, but that's nothing to do with algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. You can have a bad algorithm. Yeah, we can't have a mutant algorithm, but you can have a bad one. And that was a bad one. In fact, this probably was a great algorithm for what they politically wanted to do, which was you know punish people who were poor. So, so algorithms are going to be hugely important in the next evolution of companies. Even if you don't know you're using AI, your company will be. Yeah, so the SaaS companies that you use to help your business all use AI. If yeah. you're using LinkedIn, you're already using AI. You, mm -hmm. don't, you just don't realize it yet. So to say, oh, will my business use AI? It's a bit like saying, will it use computers? It's like it's up to you. I would think so. You better. You, I think you best in the next bit. The next bit of AI will be, does your company own the AI system you're using? Again, I would fundamentally argue, like I have done for 10 years, digital transformation is the first step. If you are not being digitally transformed now, you yeah. will not exist in three years' time. Definitely. You won't, yeah? Now, I think if you're not using AI now, you'll exist in five years' time. Yeah. Because it's going to be that quick, by the way. I, you know, I think we're already, without being too weird about it, we are far further along the AI system than people think. Yeah. There'll be so many companies working on AI which will blow people's minds. Even if you just Googled it a bit, you'd find out stuff. You'd be like, "Oh my God!" For example, I don't even get the I don't even get the the initials right. But if you looked at, is it GMPT3? Okay, that sounds like it's great. I managed to please something, something. Yeah. yeah have a look. I don't, I don't think I've got that. I'll send a link to. But literally, there is a system now. There was a system called Two, which is this is all linked to uh, Elon Musk stuff. Yeah? yeah. And they did this thing, and honestly, it's breathtaking. Yeah. Have a look at it. Right. So what this system does. AI, and you could argue, is it really AI? Is it really machine learning and natural language processing? But the point being is, is you can ask it a question and then ask it to answer you like someone would do, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah, exactly. So you basically say, what would Socrates say about this? Yeah. And then it goes out, it reads all the stuff from Socrates, and then it says, well, I'm now Socrates. I'm going to answer like I was Socrates. Wow. Yeah, exactly. But it doesn't just do that. It can then do the same, though, and say, design something like this based on these principles and then it will learn that and then it'll come back to you with a website design based on what it looked at as good web so yeah. this is the difference between build me something to consider the concept and build it and deliver it but without any outside help yeah. this exists now now technically to me that's a sentient being that already exists and these guys are just playing around with it. They had to turn off two version because they realized it all went dark and it all got horrible. But they, they turned on number three version. Yeah, exactly. It's really, I mean, that stuff's fascinating to read that. Um, but it yeah, went horribly wrong. The, but the third version, you can go and play around with yourself. You can ditch it's open source. You can just go in there, have a play around. It does amazing, wonderful things. Have a look at it. That exists right now. And that's now. In the, that's right now. Now, in six months, that'll be that on steroids. So you should be able to have a AI system inside your, if you're not working on an AI product for your company now, I'd be very worried about you if you're a tech startup and you haven't got those part. Yeah. And in five years, obviously, like you say. It, 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 I, I don't, you won't exist as a company in five years if you didn't have AI as part of it, whether you knew about it or not. Um, that's just, that's just the sad fact. But, but I mean, but also what, it's the same principle, isn't it? You know, we invented electricity and those who use electricity, you know, one, so to speak, you know, but same, same with the spinning jenny, same with the printing press. None of these things are, they're just, tech, they're just technologies. If you don't enable your company to use their technology, then your company does not exist as much. I think with the COVID thing, though, it's going to rapidly increase it. So I predicted about, I don't know, a couple of months before COVID, a couple of months before COVID, I was saying 10 years. 
and now I'm saying five. Exactly. I have a feeling like in three months I'll be saying three. Yeah. And in six months I'll say a year. Because the FTSE five, FTSE hundred companies have just, you know, Apple is now worth more than all of the FTSE hundred combined. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is the this is the new world of tech. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I think it's a really exciting place to be in. But I think one of the things we've got to remember, and I'll finish on this, is that we've got to remember that technology is exciting, but people have to come first. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm a futurist. So I'm going to talk about AI and exciting things. Yeah. But we can't forget that it's people that interact with your stuff. You might build it with AI. You might AI might be the driver that gets your lead generation. You're not but it's still going to be people. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we start, if AI systems start selling to each other, then we know we're, in... we're, we're gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah, but at the same time, then, friend, that wouldn't be a bad world, would it? If if the if the machines make the money together and you start on a beach, yeah, I'm happy sitting. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not sitting... complaining if I'm on a beach somewhere. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. I'm happy sitting. I'm happy sitting. You know, sipping pina coladas and the machine does the work in the background. I yeah. think that's my version of heaven. Yeah, happy days. Happy days, <laughs> definitely. Well, I mean, it, Dan, it's been absolutely amazing having you on. Um, there is one question I'd like to ask you, though. Uh, I always ask everyone this now. So what is the, the best piece of advice you've ever been given, and how would you evolve that and, and kind of give that out back to us now, and, and what would you tell someone? Oh, man, that's a really good question. The best piece of business advice I've ever been given, even life advice, I think, is, is, is simple. Uh, you have to kiss a lot of frogs. I like it. There you go. Yeah. Man, know. As well. <laughs> a few business. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to say about it in business, not about it in life. It's yeah. purely yeah. in business. Yeah. You have to get a lot of problems. And, it's, and it seems very, very trite and very obvious, you know, but it, that, that is the reality. And it, it sums up about three points, really. Kissing frogs doesn't sound like a nice thing to do, but you have to. Yeah. yeah. And you have to kiss a lot of them. So you have to do stuff that you don't necessarily like a lot. Yeah. And then, because of it, as we all know the old story, and then the frog becomes a prince or the princess or whatever, that the transformation happens because of the effort you've put in. Oh, but also, be prepared for it to fail loads. You've got to kiss a lot of frogs. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and as I always say before, you know, <laughs> don't sign a contract in Spanish unless you speak Spanish. Oh, that's so. a good one as well. Yeah, no, I think, you know what, we'll, we'll take that one headline. There we go. That's <laughs> But no, seriously, it's been been absolutely amazing having you on and thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day as well to, to sit down with me and thank you very much for inviting me. And I hope I hope everyone else has enjoyed the show today. And yeah, uh, you know, please please comment below. Dan will put all the links on um yeah. you know, about how to contact him and how to contact find out a bit more about Flock. So yeah, thanks guys for, for watching today and what I'll what I'll do is an extra thank you. You just thought of this Miguel was sort of gonna tell me off. But I'll put in a special link at the bottom. If, yep. you, uh, if you've got a team and you want to look in the values and things, I'll make sure that when you click that link, my tech guy will know, and then you'll get 10 uh, surveys for free rather than the, the normal way you don't get anything free. We'll make sure you get 10. As a thank you for being on this one, I'll make sure everyone who listens, maybe not everyone, let's say the first 10 people to click the link, get 10 <laughs> profiles for free, just in case. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. there there you go. Go. Well worth clicking it as well, getting looking at that. I've, I've looked at 